Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of SACAC for our first comment, our first college admission workshop. This one is on the common application. So we hope you'll find this information useful and informative. And I'm going to welcome Bina Rao from the Summit College Counseling and Lena Andrews from Vanderbilt. So I will go ahead and, and hand it over to you all. Well, thank you, Juan. Um, so today's presentation is about the common application. What we wanted to do was to give you a brief overview of what the common application asks for. We'll give you tips on how to fill out the common app itself and point out some great resources along the way that you can use to be um, with your students to be able to fill out the common app itself. So I'll let Lena take over um, with her introduction. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lena Andrews. I'm Associate Director of Undergraduate Admissions um, at Vanderbilt. I personally get to work with students from Greater Atlanta, so that's my, my Southern Territory, although, of course, I have a particular affinity for the entire SACAC um, region, the entire U.S. South. Um, but yeah, we're really excited to kind of dig in. We've packed a lot of information into these slides. I also have kind of a, a mock application open in case at any point it'd be helpful to really just like go in and actually show how it works within the Common App, um, what profile, et cetera. But we'll just kind of start going through the slides first and then I'll switch screens, pull up that, that mock Common App um, at any point if it becomes helpful to see to visualize. But yes, here's our About Us pages. <laughs> a little bit more about us. But then, um, yeah, go for it. Okay. So I was going to say, the, the, one of the resources that we wanted to point out um, at the outset is called the Access Companion. And this was a um, joint effort between the Independent um, Educational Consultants Association. So um, a whole group of independent educational consultants came together to be able to figure out and break up the Common App into individual pieces. We wrote the scripts, we you know, um, came together and then recorded videos. So it provides a step-by-step -step, um, uh, breakdown of the Common App itself. And Oregon State University was really kind to have been able to lend their resources to this project. And so it is up on, on their website. And so students have access to this free resource that literally breaks down every aspect of the Common App for them with like, you know, videos as well as audio, like visuals to be able to understand how to fill out the application itself. So the easiest way to sort of find your way to it is just Google AXS Companion Common App, and it'll take you to Oregon State University's eCampus website, where the entire um, Common App recordings are housed. Awesome. So we figured that with uh, with these tips, we'd really start at the beginning, right? Of course, the first thing you're going to want to do when using the Common App is actually create an account. Uh, and you'll want to make it pretty easy to log back in. Um, the Common App does have the option to apply both as a first year applicant to all of their partner institutions, um, but many of their partner institutions will also have the option to apply as a transfer. So uh, since I'm assuming most people here are planning, uh, looking at that first year process to apply as a freshman, make sure you're selecting the right term and the right type of application because the application will look pretty wildly different um, for the first year version that all member schools are using from the transfer option that some universities will use as well. So get that one right. Then, of course, you're going to want to just start entering your demographic information um, to kind of the best of your ability, right? Um, you'll, it should be very obvious throughout which ones are required and which ones are going to be optional in the process. Anything on these this slide you'd like to add, Dina? I think the only thing I was going to say was make sure that you enter your proper legal name as it appears on your school documents and you know, so that that way when your records go in universities have the ability to match um, information that's being sent in on your behalf with your name itself so make sure you're using the correct legal name if you um if you spend time between different houses choose the one that has where you spend the most amount of time um, and if you're in a situation where you may be homeless um, or may not have a permanent fixed address, then speak to your counselor to be able to figure out what address you should best enter into that um, 
thing itself. And if you qualify for a common app fee waiver, there are a number of conditions that they've already outlined that you can choose from to be able to apply. And then basically the application fees for schools are waived if you end up qualifying for the common app fee waiver. Yeah, absolutely. Those are all really good points to make. Uh, and then kind of you're going to continue to just kind of fill things out as you go. Do you know that for schools that are holistic in the review process, including Vanderbilt, absolutely every piece of this is stuff that can provide context to us. And everything that is on the application is on the table for holistic schools to use as the process. And kind of, um, I'm sure this is covered in other webinars or things you've seen elsewhere. But when I say the word holistic, I mean those schools that, yeah, are using the whole of the application. Um, that is not the most common way to review applications. There are quite a few schools that do it that way. Certainly at the schools that maybe um, make the news the most often, many of them are going to use that holistic process. So the, the selective schools and the highly selective, but the vast majority of colleges and universities in this country will actually use what's called a formulaic process, where it is a, you have this GPA, you have this testing, um, it's either going to be minimums and you're automatically in or some kind of grid, but there's a formula to it. So when I say these things can be used for context, it's only going to be at those schools that use that holistic review process. But as you continue to fill it out, um, lists in schools and community colleges, um, typically it's really helpful to have your transcript, or an unofficial version at least, near you when you're filling out kind of these the initial sections of the Common App um, so that you can provide us kind of with the most accurate information at the moment you're beginning to fill it out. Uh, Vina, I'll let you kind of do that next part. Sure. So uh, one of the things that you will be asked to enter is the classes that you're taking during your senior year. So what this means is you need to know what you're taking now and for the second semester. So you, you will have to, you know, you'll be able to accurately enter in what your um, curriculum looks like for this school year, because the universities who are going to review your application will want to know what it is you're taking and look at the, they will look at the rigor of your curriculum and the classes that you've taken. But if there's any deviation from this course, the course list that you listed on your application, once you've submitted it, it is important that you reach back out to the universities that you've applied to, to let them know that there were changes made to your application, to your course load, so that they find out in advance, rather than waiting for the transcript post-graduation to arrive, to let them know that there were changes in your curriculum. Um, and definitely list all the academic honors that you've received, because that is part of um, the application requirement, is that they ask you, have you received any academic honors? So be sure to list those. Yeah, absolutely. And that um, brings up for me too. Make sure that on those senior courses, you are not just as accurate as possible because yes, we'll, we don't, we want to know about any changes, things like that. So that when we get the transcript, it all matches. Um, but for many schools out there, senior courses might actually not be listed on the transcript at all. So this is the only part in the application where I get to see what you're actually taking in your senior year as I'm going through. So um, make sure that you're listing the level of the course and the title of the course correctly. So uh, if things are AP, you're definitely going to list them as AP and they must be kind of officially an AP class, right? It must be officially an honors, just not kind of something that you feel like is an honors, right? Make sure you're using the correct designation that is equivalent to what your high school uses because that is what will be then matching with the transcript later. So I think some of the universities will ask you for a transcript and will rely entirely on the transcript to figure out what you've taken from, you know, in, in all of your subjects throughout high school. Whereas others, there are universities that will re require you to list everything you've taken in throughout high school into the Common App itself. So once you add colleges to your list on the Common App, you'll know exactly which colleges require that level of detail to be submitted as part of the application process. 
Yeah, absolutely. Another important part as you're going through to fill it out is going to be the testing section and understanding the testing policies of the schools that you're applying to. So when filling out the Common App, it does make sense to go ahead and self-report test scores in this section, knowing that schools that then off that use the Common App will have some type of supplement if tests are not actually required, right? So at Vanderbilt, we continue to be a test optional school having the self for filling out the self-reported thing. If you then in the Vanderbilt specific section say you don't want your testing to be considered for Vanderbilt, our system automatically masks that page for all of our readers. Um, and my understanding from talking to other friends at other schools is that's gonna be pretty similar for other schools that are using the Common or the Coalition app, one of these big platforms that so many schools use, right? they will be very different likely for schools that use their own specific application, but for schools Schools that are using the Common App and the Coalition and are test optional, test bind, or test flexible, um, you should still, even if you're planning to apply with those schools without testing, it still likely makes sense to self-report your scores in this section of the Common App. So that can be, I know, a little confusing for students, um, especially since maybe your test scores are something you definitely want to submit to one of the schools you're applying to and not to another school. Um, Hopefully, uh, the colleges on our side have all really thought through what that process means and what it looks like. Phoenix, yeah. No, I was just going to just explain the test optional. Test optional um, basically means that this university is giving you the option of submitting scores. And, the, in, and then you obviously have the choice, as, as Lena just said, to be able to figure out which universities you want to submit the scores to and which ones you do not. Test blind means regardless of whether or not you've submitted scores, they're not looking at it in the ad admissions process. And there are a number of universities around the country that are test blind. Um, and even for the test optional movement, there were over a thousand universities that were test optional before the pandemic began. And so, you know, the movement has now continued through the pandemic. And we don't know when that's going to stop, but at least there are a number of universities for fall 2023 students who are still remain test optional. Test flexible is, again, it'll be on a university's website if they are adopting a test flexible policy, where they're allowing you to submit other things in lieu of testing, um, meaning in, in lieu of um, SAT, ACT scores, they may have other options for you to be able to submit um, as part of your um, application consideration. So just understand what these differences are. It's really important that you pay attention to the test ranges within universities before deciding whether or not you want to submit your test score, but your counselor in your high school is a great resource to be able to help you navigate um, this particular question itself. And you can definitely bring it up to the universities who come and visit your schools, <clears throat> excuse me, to be able to ask them the question about whether or not you should submit test scores. But know that in Florida and in Georgia, there are a number of public universities that require testing to be submitted as part of the application process. So you may not be able to escape that if you're applying to some of these public universities within Florida and Georgia. Additionally, there's going to be some institutions that are going to be test optional for the admissions process, but they will require testing in order to be considered for the merit scholarships. And um, so if they're requiring testing for the merit scholarships, that probably also gives you a sense of the value they're still putting on that testing. Um, other institutions, Vanderbilt as an example, we are truly test optional, only for the testing if it's something you want us to see and you want us to consider. But hopefully the university representatives from each of those schools should be really upfront about what that means for their institution, but it is gonna take a good amount of research on your end for your full list of schools to kind of figure out what test optional really means school to school, what testing does and doesn't make sense to be submitted from school to school. And then the activities section, I think this is probably the, the area of the application that I get the most questions on how to most effectively fill out for the Common App. You know, is that true in your experience as well? Yes, it is. Trying to figure out which 10 need to be reported, how to report them, how to get them down to 150 mm -hmm. characters is also very difficult. So um, it is very much a big part of the application as well. And the big question of what are considered activities, the, re the reality is anything you're doing with your time outside the classroom is, is an activity that in many ways is worth 
is worth telling us about, right? Hanging out with friends, maybe not, um, but uh, just about anything else is really on the table. What, um, what we say and what schools will say they're looking for is that we're looking to see the impact you've made on the communities and the or community that you're involved in, right? That community absolutely includes your high school community. I absolutely want to hear about clubs, choir, um, student government, athletics, right? And I want to hear about the impact you're having in those areas. And Vina wrote some really great tips for us on a coming slide of kind of what to include in that, that overview. Um, but I also want to hear about communities you might be involved in outside the classroom, right? I want to hear about those service communities. I want to hear about faith communities. I want to hear about job communities, right? With those part-time jobs. It's not just ours. I want to hear if you've gotten any kind of acknowledgments, like being employee of the week, like getting a promotion, getting a raise, right? Those are all really big indicators of the impact you might be making in that area. And I also want to hear about your family community, right? If you've had to take on increased responsibilities at home, Home, either as a result of the pandemic or long before it. Um, those are also really meaningful ways you may be using your time and making an impact on those around you, right? If you've had to help a younger sibling adjust to virtual learning, um, if you've had to be a caregiver for an elderly relative, those, those are absolutely ways you're making an impact things I want to know about and be able to consider as part of the process. But we, the colleges, are really relying on you to advocate for yourself and tell us about those things you're doing, right? So here are some great tips um, that I'll let and be to go through. Sure. So in terms of like maximizing the ability to explain what it is you're doing, there are obviously two different like um, boxes just before you explain what it is you do and the impact of your work. It, one is it, it asks you to tell them your role in any organization or in, in any activity. So use that 50 character count to be able to do that. The organization's name and the explanation of what the organization is, is 100 characters. Use that as well. So you're not necessarily repeating the name of the organization and your title in the 150 characters that you need to be able to use to describe your impact. So try and like, you know, strategize when you when it comes to doing this. Try and measure, like if you've got an impact. So one of my students had talked about the idea that he, his, um, his robotics Instagram account went from 200 people to 900 people. So he had, he had obviously marketed enough and done enough of a huge marketing campaign to be able to get that. Like include that kind of a number. If you've raised money, include the number, of, like, you know, include the money. If you've recruited people to join your efforts, talk about that. But so that you, there's a tangible impact that can be seen just because you've entered thing, uh, figures like that. Um, when you're trying to explain your role in activities, try and use active verbs. So develop, define. And if you Google active verbs for resume purposes, there are like a number of lists that show up. So like tap into those kind of resources that are available online when you're trying to draft your activities list itself. You don't have to write full sentences. That's another way to kind of save space. You don't have to write an I sentence, just at, do it almost like you would in a resume, bullet point the thing if need be, because it's the characters that count. So every space, comma, period, all of it ends up being like taking away like valuable space that you need to be able to explain yourself. If it's something that you're still doing in your senior year, use the present tense um, and try and start with your most significant leadership role to begin with. Because I know a lot of students have been in organizations from grades nine onwards. So rather than like talking about everything you've done, start with the most senior year where you've got the most or the year where you've had the most responsibility and sort of explain what that was. Um, if it's a one-off activity, like, you know, you went in and helped out at a marathon for four hours, figure out if it needs to be in your top 10 list of activities itself. Um, and so, you know, part of this is strategizing to be able to figure out where the impact is and where you can showcase some part of yourself that allows the university to see different things about you. Um, obviously, avoid um, extreme language. I want to end poverty. I want to end homelessness. So you want to make a dent, right? You want to be able to take part in an activity that allows to, something to be like beneficial to, to others. So I think try and use words that allow us to see um, the measurable impact of your work itself. And then, uh, as I said, use those active like um, words 
lists that you can find online to be able to describe your activity. So then you're using your word count appropriately and you're also taking credit for the work that you've put into some of these clubs and roles. Um, and I think if you're a, a member or a participant, you don't need to keep using membership, I'm just a member in the title role, try and figure out what exactly the impact of your work is in that organization and perhaps reference that in the role um, that you're going to describe in an organization. So you move to the next slide. Absolutely. And so I'll let you do this one. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was going to kind of even say on that, I know that, that that it says at the top of those activities, rank your activities can be really stressful for students. Don't, don't worry too much about that. As we said, it's really best practice to put the things you are still actively involved in as a senior, the things where you're having the biggest area of impact at the top. But don't stress about, well, if I put on president of this club first and president of that club second, they're going to think I care more about this club than the other one. We will not. We just want to see that generally the things that you're currently making the biggest impact now are at the beginning. That just really helps us as readers as we're going through and trying to figure out what that kind of impact looks like. Don't, and once, and also don't stress out too much. I have had students who in some ways have kind of failed as a harsh word, but have done it almost wrong of a rank that like, that did catch our attention because it made no sense. I would say kind of the most egregious examples I heard, what saw was a student who was a girl state governor, which is a huge, massive deal, and listed that number 10. And we were like, oh, huh, didn't expect that one to be the last thing, but it didn't matter. We still knew she was a girl state governor. It did not affect um, the, the way her application proceeded through the process or the notes we took. It just kind of was a little, little surprising, right? So generally just the bigger things at the front, don't stress about what's one, what's two, what's three, just the big things you're doing right now should be it is best practice to have those near the top. Um, so yes, this is a big thing though. Don't stress the truth about what you are doing or have done in your, your activities. Um, my, um, our former director, um, John Gaines would always describe this as, don't say you're the president if you're actually the co-president. There's a very good chance your co your fellow co-president is also in our application pool. And we're going to see those applications potentially back to back and be like, huh, didn't that other student say they were president? How is this lining up, right? Tell us your true title. Tell us what that impact is. Don't, don't stretch the truth, but also don't undersell your contributions either, right? You are the best advocate for yourself in this process. You are the first person I'm going to hear about what you what you really accomplished from. And it's a good chance your letters of recommendation will further support it and back it up, right? But you're the first, you're the one who's really going to tell me what you have accomplished, the impact you've made. I do want students that are advocating for themselves and are not underselling, but I also don't want students that are stretching the truth, right? Um, so kind of walk that line, walk that balance of making sure um, that yeah, you're really, you're, you're putting your best foot forward in a way that is still authentic and accurate, right? And then oh, this other, this is a big question that I get all the time is how do you calculate the time and how do you average the hours that you spend on each activity, right? Another kind of sort of leap here, it's not something you need to stress too much by any means, but I would say if suddenly we're looking at the hours and we're like, there aren't this many hours in a week, right? And they've, they've told us that um, between all these different school year round activities, they're spending like 20 hours a week on multiple activities. And that doesn't include schoolwork. It's gonna raise some questions of like, huh, I think there might be some exaggeration here, right? Um, so again, here, it's not, I don't, don't need any kind of panic between, okay, do I say five hours a week? Do I say six hours a week? Sometimes it's 10 hours a week. Sometimes it's one hour a week. Don't stress too much about that. Give it kind of the best sense of accuracy that you can. 
and don't go overboard, right? <laughs> those I think are my best tips on the calculating time. Vino, you know, what do you have on those? I think the only thing I would say is if there are activities that truly you've spent a lot of time on. One of my students um, last year was a dancer. So during the summer, she was in dance camp, like, you know, for pretty much most of the summer, almost six to eight hours a day. So when you try and average that out over the year, it ended up being a lot of hours. So what we did was, and we'll get to this when we get to the writing section, there is something called the additional information section in the Common App, where you can perhaps go in and explain a couple of these things in that space. So that if you feel like, you know, you've spent a lot of time doing something and the 150 characters do not give you the room to be able to explain what it is you've done, the impact of your work, the extent of your work, perhaps take the opportunity in the additional info section to be able to give a little bit more detail about the specific activity that you've been engaged in. So now on to the next probably most commonly asked about question as part of the Common App, the personal statement. What are we looking for? Um, I mean, the one thing we certainly are looking for is strong grammar and writing skills, right? But, and we are looking for it to be all about you. Otherwise, in maybe a kind of scary way, there are no rules. I've seen fantastic essays written about just about every topic under the sun. One of my favorite ones over the past couple of years was actually about types of toilet paper. So you really can kind of pick um, any any topic and make it appropriate, make sense for this. The, the riskiest topics, in my opinion, are going to be ones that are more of what I call kind of admiration essays, where you're writing your essay about someone else that you really admire. That is an okay starting point. I have certainly seen it done really effectively as a starting point, but it's really easy for that essay to become something where I get to the end and I think, wow, grandma sounds really, really cool. I really wish I could meet grandma, right? So admiration essays are going to be, to me, the trickiest topic to pull off because that it is your personal statement. It is supposed to be all about you. I want to learn about you and what you would bring to our campus. I think the other biggest common stumbling block is essays that don't sound like they're written by a 17 or 18 year old, right? So we all have really wonderful, loving adults in our lives who are just trying to help by doing a lot of great editing, right, on our essay. Don't let your essay lose your voice. It makes total sense for someone to proofread and t catch the times where you did T-E-H instead of T-H-E, right? And things along those lines, grammatical things. But make sure that essay doesn't lose the voice of a high school student because we can absolutely feel that as readers. Um, and that will will change the way that the, makes us feel about the essay, right? It's not going to throw it to totally ruin an application or anything like that, but it will be kind of a missed opportunity for me to feel like I've gotten to know you as an applicant that much better. Because what we often say with the essays is this is the part where you do get to remind us that you are real human beings with thoughts, feelings, and a personality, not just a list of grades and extracurricular activities. So we are looking for your personality, for your voice to come through. And the other thing that kind of I say as part of that is this does not need to be super formally written. It does need to have proper grammar and writing skills, right? But it does not need to in any way read like a very formal essay that you might write for your AP literature and composition class, right? Um, it can be more informal in tone. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think the, the only thing I, I would probably add is that um, it, we, the one reason why the personal statement feels so different in terms of a piece of writing is that it feels so different than, for instance, um, uh, an essay that you've written for history, right? You're writing about a specific time period, specific like incidents or whatever. Here, the, the content is you. And so you really do have to take time to be able to like brainstorm these essays, showcase and provide insight into who you are, what you value, um, what makes you different, what makes you come alive. So I think this is the opportunity that you have to sort of come alive in the application. So take it to be able to share your story. And I think one of the things that, like, one of the rules that you should probably kind of live by is you can brainstorm ideas with other people, but save and wait until you're almost close to your final draft before you 
like get anybody else to opine on the essay because otherwise everybody else's voice does creep in as Lena has said in the essay process and it no longer sounds like a cohesive essay or it no longer is probably a true reflection of you as a student so this is your opportunity to basically almost speak to an admissions officer on paper so take it to be able to tell us uh, tell no, not uh, tell us tell them tell the admissions officers who you are um and you know what makes you unique different and what makes you a valuable addition to their campus absolutely and so i will say on the common app there are the questions there are the prompts right i will be very honest as someone who has read thousands of Common App essays every year. I can't tell you what the prompts are in any given year because since we Vanderbilt didn't choose those prompts, right? I'm really more just looking for the student to tell me a lot about themselves. So don't stress, don't really stress too much about meeting the prompt on the main personal statement within the Common App or the coalition application. That is gonna be the total opposite of advice of what I will give you for uh, the supplemental essays later on or for, for merit scholarship essays, right? So for the Common App, totally fine to kind of just use the prompt as a starting off place and then not necessarily answer that, make it your own kind of cohesive essay. Um, but for any of any additional writing supplements that schools might ask for in those places, the school has spent a lot of time writing that question and we really want you to answer that question. Um, so kind of just a little nuance to the process in some ways there. Um, after, oh, sorry, go for it. Sorry, the only thing I was going to add was prompt seven, which is the last prompt on the Common App, right, is an open-ended prompt. It says, tell us anything you want us to know about you. So that's also a great starting off point if you don't feel like an essay fits into any of the other questions that are up there. So use the free-for-all prompt to be able to write your essay. Um, so that was my only other tip. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. After the essay, we'll get to the additional information section. The additional information section um, can be used in many, many different ways to really tackle anything that you feel is essential that we as the admissions office know that isn't going to come out in other parts of the application. I would say the one thing the additional information section is definitely not for is to write an additional essay, right? When I see an additional essay in the additional information section, it's getting a light skin at the best because that is not what that space is for. We have our writing supplements. We have the essay. That's really what we want. What I want in the additional information session is any kind of special circumstances you feel like I need to know. Any situations like Vina said where, hey, you have an extracurricular that looks really different in the summer than it does in the school year and you want to give us that extra context. There's a couple more. Maybe you're in something like um, an activity like debate that has a ton of different tournaments and awards, and you really want to tell us about those specific tournaments and awards, that is a fine thing. You can use the additional information section. I anything that you don't feel like has been made clear through how you had to talk about it before, any additional insight behind, I had a really bad grade dip that semester, but I think it's really important for you to know that I got a concussion in soccer, right? Those types of things are what's really important for us to know in the additional information section. Um, otherwise, and, and in general in the section, it does not need to be full sentences, bullet points, totally fine, right? If it is best, if you are, you do just best communicate in full sentences, give me one or two sentences on each kind of thing that you need to clarify. I certainly do not need full paragraphs to kind of explain additional context. You can be very straight to the point. That is the, what is most helpful for me as a reader by far when going through this additional information section. Mm -hmm. And then the, also on the additional information section there, um, when COVID hit, there was a question that was specifically added as a place for students to tell us more about how they were affected by COVID. Um, the question has now been expanded to also include um, natural disasters um, and kind of deep long lasting impacts those can have. This is not a required question. This is an optional question that is best used for students that really feel like they have something they need to provide. I do think it is really helpful to also remember that in the context of these, this question, some students are going to have to use it for things that are 
incredibly incredibly hard for readers to take, right? That we certainly wish that that no one had ever experienced, but it's a really important context for us to have when it comes to these world-shaking things that, that often students have experienced over the past couple of years um, that have certainly impacted their time in high school. That is in no way to say that if you have something that maybe isn't quite as world-shaking that has been been impacted by COVID or a natural disaster, right? If there was um, a state championship game that wasn't played, if there was a summer program, especially um, a really selective, maybe state-sponsored summer program that you ended up not being able to attend to or got canceled because of something that you can't let us know about that, I would just say be mindful about kind of the language you use. Sometimes as a reader, it can be really jarring to have this question um, be something where I read about something that is really unimaginable that has to do with often a loss of family member, a loss of home, things like that, right, as a result of COVID or natural disasters, and then go on to the next application and have a student writing um, about how the worst thing they could ever imagine was this, this state soccer, or the soccer state championship match getting canceled, right? Kind of just keep in mind, those, that is an absolutely appropriate thing to, to tell me, but be really mindful about the language that you use and kind of the scale that you're giving these things when talking about it, because it can be, this question can be somewhat jarring for the reader, if that if that's kind of a helpful way to, to describe it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, courses and grades. I guess back to you, Vina, this is back to what you were re referencing at the beginning. Correct. So there are some universities where you will be required as a student to enter in grades that you've um, received in classes, some going back to middle school, because some of the math and language classes for some students, initial levels start in middle school, but then entering every grade that you've had from um, high school into the transcript. Part of this is you need to make sure that you've got a transcript in front of you and that you're entering the grades exactly as they appear on the transcript. Make sure you double check, triple check every entry so that when you've finished that ninth through 11th grade um, grades, you've now come in with an accurate summary of your grades itself. Obviously, if you're going to submit any applications post um, January, which is the end of your first semester, if the school is asking for your senior year grades as well, then you would probably have to enter that. But make sure that your entries are accurate. Have someone else double check them if you need to, so, uh, to make sure that they're using the transcript and entering the grades accordingly. Because accuracy does matter because some of these things may come to bite you if you end up um, inaccurately reflect, uh, entering grades in. Um, and again, your senior year courses, it's really important that you know what you're taking, you've committed to them because the universities are going to rely on your, on your description of what it is you're taking in your senior year to be able to judge the rigor of your curriculum and um, you know, understand how you are stretching yourself in your senior year as well. And so the, the next part of this is to make sure that, you know, once you are done with the common app section, you have the ability to then go in and start adding specific colleges that you want to apply to onto your list itself. Once you add the colleges to your college list, when you click on those individual colleges, you will be able to see what specific questions they have that they want you to answer. Most of them will ask you for a first and or second choice major that you need to list for them. Um, there will also, there may be supplemental essay questions that pop up once you, um, you know, add a college and or choose a major. Because some of these um, as supplemental essay questions only pop up when you actually enter in a specific major. So you need to be able to do some of those things early on and you're not waiting until the deadline approaches to go in and then add colleges because you may or may not be able to you know, figure out what essays are due for these institutions until you actually fill out those university specific questions on the application itself. And then the other part, of the, the, another big component of this is understanding the different deadlines. So there are obviously dif differences between early action, 
early decision, regular decision, and rolling admission. Early action is, is, is a deadline that's going to come early on in the application process, but the beauty of this is you, as long as you've got an application that's completed and you think it's ready to submit, you get to submit it, you hear back from the colleges relatively early on, some as early as like mid-December, and then you've got time to then figure out whether you want to commit to this institution or not. It is not a binding decision. Early decision is different. Early decision is a binding decision. So there are a number of universities that offer early decision only, and then the next um, optional admission cycle is regular decision for them. But the early decision is a binding decision, meaning you're basically saying, if you admit me, I will come to your institution itself. Um, there may be circumstances under which they will let you out of that decision-making process, but you know, that is the, the agreement that you're entering into. Um, and this agreement is signed by the student, the parents, and the high school counselor. And then you submit your application under this particular process. Um, regular decision are the later deadlines. Most of these will vary from school to school. Again, it's really important that you check the websites of the schools that you're applying to to figure out what options they're offering. And there are some schools that are rolling admission, meaning that as students submit the applications within sometimes within days, sometimes within weeks um, or, or a month or so, you're getting a decision about whether or not you've been admitted to the process. It's really good if you have a little bit of anxiety to be able to engage in that um, rolling admissions process because you at least know you you are going to university because you've got one like you know university that's already admitted you. And I'll I, I'll sort of share like a funny thing. I was sitting on my couch one day when my my daughter was a senior, and all of a sudden I got an um, email alert saying that there was um, a online transaction and it was a university's like. Um, a, like fee that had been paid. She found out that some university was offering um, um, rolling admissions. And she said, I heard that they give me a decision within a day. So she decided to hit submit on the applic on the common app because she was so anxious about trying to hear back from somebody. But rolling admissions are easier because easier in the sense that you get to hear back a lot sooner from most of the universities about whether or not you've been admitted. But understand what the, each of these deadlines mean, um, so that then you're applying, um, you know, with that with that with those factors in mind. So then, oh, sorry, go for it. <laughs> You're also going to have to go ahead and list um, recommenders within it, within the website um, to kind of meet each college's requirements for what types of letters might be required. Uh, many schools require um, one counselor recommendation and maybe two, sometimes three, maybe sometimes only one, sometimes zero teacher recommendations, but you can find that specific requirement also within kind of the colleges that you've added. Um, when thinking about who to ask for your letters of recommendation, there's there's a couple of different tips for this. Um, most schools will say that they really want it to come but from a, a teacher from your junior or senior year. Realistically, you may not have really built much of a relationship with your senior year teachers, right, when it comes time to ask. Maybe there might be some some, uh, some exceptions, uh, some senior year teachers that you also had in 10th grade, so they've kind of gotten to see, start to see that growth, something like that. But for the most part, most students will opt to go with those 11th grade teachers. I get a lot of questions on what um, courses they should choose, uh, students should choose, right? If they're looking to go into a STEM subject, do they need to have both recommenders from the STEM field, et cetera? I truly say that it is helpful if you are going, if for whichever area you're going to, to have one teacher that is from kind of the same general type of area. So yeah, if you are looking at an engineering program, a physics, math program, sometimes it can it can be really helpful to make sure that at least one of your recommendations is from um, physics, chemistry, biology, or math, right, one of those areas. Um, but for most schools, especially schools that have a liberal arts feel, it's still going to be really helpful to have someone that's formed more of a humanity, social science, English as kind of one of them, like getting to see kind of how your mind works in both fields. I will also say that sometimes the letters from teachers that 
are not necessarily your naturally best subjects can actually be far more compelling and far better than teachers from the subject that you are a total rock star in. So um, I was a, a history major in college. I absolutely loved my AP US and AP Euro history teacher during um, high school. And that is who ultimately wrote my letter of recommendation. And while I assume he did a great job and it probably was a great letter of recommendation, quite honestly, I probably would have had a better letter of recommendation for my advanced physics teacher. Um, I was not naturally gifted at physics. It was not my easiest subject for, for sure. I had to spend a lot more time um, working with that, with that teacher, kind of coming in early, staying late to ask questions, to, to excel in that course um, in a way that I just didn't with history, which did come um, fit my natural interest so much more, right? Uh, and so I imagine that I, that letter from my advanced physics teacher actually probably would have been a lot better because he would have been able to talk about about how I responded to struggle, how I processed new information, uh, the work ethic that I had to show in order to do well in that class versus my, my history class who really enjoyed those, those conversations, but it certainly wasn't something where I was having to come earlier, stay late to, to rock and do really well in that class. Yeah. I think a great source of like, you know, um, information about how teachers write letters of recommendation and how is probably your high school counselor because she may very well seen the letters that they to some of these teachers have written so it might be a good idea to bounce the idea of like you know who you're approaching with your um, counselor for instance and then part of this also gets to the next part of what we're trying to cover here which is the waiving of the FERPA rights um, so as part of the common application process, one of the things that students are asked to do is they're asked to um, waive their rights to read the letters of recommendation and any of the records that the school is submitting on their behalf to the colleges itself. Universities, and when you read the declaration, it clearly says that universities feel like when the student waives the right to read the letters of recommendation that the teachers are writing, they believe that they're getting more honest feedback from those teachers about um, the student itself. And so this is part of the calculation that you have to make. Once you waive it for one school, you're basically waiving it for all of them. Um, and so th that's what you need to be aware of as well, that one, as soon as you start attempt to try and submit um, letters of recommendation, there's a fa the FERPA warning comes up. Once you waive your rights to read those letters of recommendation, you waive them for all the colleges on your list itself. But one of the things that I would warn students about is make sure you know when your school has set deadlines for you to be able to ask the teachers, ask the counselors. A lot of these deadlines um, to request letters of recommendation come early in the process, because especially if you're applying early action to schools and or early decision, because those deadlines come up quite soon, teachers need time to be able to write those letters of rec as do counselors. So it's important that you ask them early in the process. And one of the things that I would encourage students to do is give teachers something to write about. So if there are particular assignments in class that you've done really well in um, and or specific things that are conversations you remember contributing to in the classroom that had a impact on the discussion. If you helped other students, you know, um, understand the material, share some of those like vignettes with your teachers and your counselor, because it's important that they have concrete examples to be able to write good letters for you. So give them the tools that they need to be able to write you your letters of recommendation. Absolutely. And then what else do you need to do after you submit the, the Common App, right? Well, you need to actually have your way to track when things get to all of the schools. So most schools, many schools now that um, use the Common App, as well as those that use their own applications or other application processes. Um, processes have some version of their own portal. Vanderbilt, we call it the Matt, My App for You portal. We all kind of have our clever -y names that we call our version. Um, typically, within a couple of business days of submitting your common app to a school, you'll gain access or get your login credentials to their portal. It is really important that you 
keep these well organized, you log into these, you check these, because this is where you're going to have your checklist to tell you that actually we have received, especially those letters of recommendation, those transcripts, the things that need to come from other people that are not you. There also might be additional things available in the portal. I know at Vanderbilt, that's where we keep our merit scholarship applications. Um, so it's really important for you to be able to log in there. It's where you can request an optional alumni interview. It's where you can make sure we've also gotten that financial aid um, information, right, that we've received the FAFSA, where you can make updates to the FAFSA or updates to the CSS profile. It's also where you can log any other updates that you want. So as Vina said, if you make class changes, a lot of schools will have places where you can just upload that stuff right there. Instead of having to find an email to send it to, you'll be able to update um, an updated course information. You can update sometimes self-reported test scores, um, kind of et cetera, et cetera. But in order to know what you can do at each school, what you can update, you have to actually create that portal and keep those passwords close to you. Um, and then, you know, you want to touch on that? No, I was going to so, say, um, one of the things that happens every year, right around that November 1st deadline is everybody is trying to log in on October 30th. Right. And so, and was, is it 31st is Halloween, whatever it is. So you don't wait till the last minute to try and submit your applications because any number of things could go wrong. So it's really important that, it, you know, try and do it days before the deadline rather than like minutes or hours before the deadline. Because if you miss the submission date, then, you know, you may very well be disqualified. And some of these things are nuances in the sense that you're, even though like, you know, Hawaii is the furthest end of the spectrum, you may only be allowed to submit an application by the deadline in your time zone. So obviously that, you know, we need to make sure that you submit your application within the deadline allowed by the university for your time zone. Try not to wait till the last minute. And the other thing that I would actually say is there are certain institutions where a secondary part of the application doesn't open until you've submitted your primary like Common App itself. So for instance, um, at some of the universities, like at one, what comes to mind is Arizona State has a honors um, college. The application for that only opens if you've submitted the main application early on. And so it's really important that you make sure that you know there are no other parts of the application that kick in that require you to upload additional materials um, before the deadline set by the university. So if that's the case, if there's a November 1 deadline and you needed additional applications submitted, you probably have to submit it at least four or five days in advance so that your portal opens and then you can upload additional materials. So it's really important. I think as you, as you hear us talk, know your colleges, know the schools and what they're asking you to do so that you are aware and are tracking all of this information for yourselves. Um, it is a tedious process, but you know what, the rewards are awesome, which is like, you know, you get to hear um, and figure out where you're going to be spending the next four years. One of the things that we will, uh, that we need to hit upon, of obviously, is the supplemental essays. And I really would like Lena to talk about, like, why it's important to do the research to be able to answer the supplemental prompts that universities put out. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, supplement essays are going to vary, and sorry, switching back, this is, um, once again, if you want to re um, access that additional resource that Vina was talking about at the beginning of the webinar, um, this is going to be the link and kind of also what you can Google, since obviously you can't copy and paste the link from the, directly from this slide. Um, but in terms of supplemental essays, what those look like is going to vary a lot by institution to institution. And whatever that supplemental question is, I guarantee it's been run through a whole lot of internal committees at that institution to pick that wording. We care very deeply about the thing we are choosing to ask you about. A lot of schools will have their why blank institution um, essay. That one is really you need to have done really deep research to be able to talk about why 
that institution is a place that you think you'd be a really good fit to you. And it can be really helpful in those to not only be able to talk about maybe how beautiful the campus is, but also be able to talk about why the academic program that you're looking at um, is really of interest to you or why if you are undecided, why you think that's the best place to be undecided, why all those options are gonna be available to you. Um, other schools like Vanderbilt, we're not gonna have an institutional specific inform um, essay. We have two additional or two options for a supplemental essay. Only one has to actually be submitted. You'll have two questions you can choose from. One that asks you to expand on your extracurricular and one that asks about how you engage with people that have different viewpoints than your own. Those questions are incredibly important to us. Those are probably the areas we feel are like the most Vandy things. We feel Vandy is very much a place where we're all about um, kind of how highly engaged our students are on our campus. That's why we love to hear more about your extracurriculars. We're also a place that is very into a very collaborative learning experience, which is also why we give students the option to talk about their different viewpoints. Those things matter to us, and it's really important that students, um, that for us to understand who would be a good fit at Vanderbilt, that's why we're asking. So any of those questions you ask, it's really important to think about how you would engage on it, engage with that area at that campus, um, and to have done deeper research into that institution when you're filling it out, because a lot of places will put a lot of weight into their supplemental questions specifically because it's the one part where you get to say something specifically about us. Right? I think well, one of the other tips that comes across when you listen to a lot of admissions officers speak as well, when they have those why us and why major questions, you shouldn't be able to take an essay that you've submitted to um, Georgia Tech, block out the name GT at the top and have you be able to submit um, you know, substitute another name of another campus in there, right? So it has to be specific, meaning, um, and one of the reasons why we put this resource back up here is there is a section on answering supplemental essays on this Access Companion. And um, Tim Brunhold of the University of Southern California has given a, like a, a great answer for how you and specifically answer the why um, us question and the why major question um, in this particular resource. But it is really important that you delve deep into the mission statement of the university, understand what they value um, and who they're looking for in terms of students. Try and understand, like, you know, if you're looking at and they're asking you, why do you want to do this major at, and it's the question is, at our institution, even though it's not explicitly said, that is what they want you to be able to do, which then means you need to go in and do a deep dive about the major, look to see what courses you wanna take, look at professors, the research that they're doing, um, what are the internship opportunities, what are the other study abroad and or other unique opportunities that the school provides and be able to speak to that and, and explain why it's important. You're not repeating the brochure back to them. You're not repeating website language back to them. Because I think um, when Lena and I were talking about the supplemental essays, one of the things that she did bring up was some of these admissions officers may have very well written some of these like, you know, um, statements for their university, which then means don't requote the brochures. Talk about your connection to the university, your place within it. Um, so these are, the supplemental essays are really important, even if they say optional, treat it as a required essay, and then, you know, answer the, uh, the questions that they're asking you to write about. Um, I think that comes, that basically ends our presentation at this point. So I think we can go to questions within the chat. Um, and I think one of the questions, um, that has been submitted is other than timing, what is the benefit of one admission period like early decision over other admission periods? Lena, do you wanna do it? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the most straightforward, quick answer is often schools do have higher admit rates um, during um, both early action and early decision. It's gonna typically be the mark markedly the most friendlier than regular decision for schools that do do an early decision. So that binding process where you are saying, if admitted, you will attend. But many schools will also have a friendlier uh, admit rate during early action as well. There's a number of reasons for this. Sometimes it is a strategic enrollment choice that the institution's making. It's also a result of the fact that 
we're not quite as stressed in November reading applications as we are in the spring. We have a little bit more time to dive in to really get to know a student before we're kind of under the weight of making those spring decisions. Um, and then it's also because during early action, during early decision, we haven't filled any of our beds or filled any of our seats yet, right? Whereas by the time we get to the regular decision, a lot of our seats have already been filled um, by students that were admitted either during, during an early, early process. And I think some of it might be like a nominal difference, right? Between ED, so for some of the super selectives, like if you're looking at some of the um, IVs and stuff, because I just went through um, the stats. You're talking about a 15% admit rate in ED versus the 5% or lower in, in like in the regular decision round. So it's just a matter of like, you know, but again, you need to be part of the pool of people that they're actually looking to fill those seats. Mm -hmm. And so understanding the priorities of the institution are part of this process, but early decision is binding. That's the only advantage um, that comes because for some institutions, they're filling um, close to half, if not more of their um, seats through the early decision round itself. Mm -hmm. um, David has raised his hand. I don't know how to. David, I think you should be able to unmute yourself slash we might be able to right here. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, thank you so much. This was very informative and I appreciate you guys sharing. Um, I'm a new admissions or college counselor and I feel like I wanted to ask you, what is the best way to reach out or best time to reach out to uh, counselors at different schools to get them to come out to get up to get help because I, I mean I don't know if I'm the only college counselor that's new but I feel like I got I'm got a, a water hose in my face and I can't you know with so much happening in the early with the early uh early um admission if you will like so much coming up down a pipe I guess the question so how can what is the what advice would you give me to reach out to other schools and get people to come in and like help with this I know that's kind of not exactly what we're talking about, but sorry. No, absolutely. So I'd say um, from the, the college side of things, uh, it's probably great to go ahead and reach out now. I will say at this point, you might not get a super fast response from a lot of schools because of course we're already out on the road traveling. So it might take a few more business days than maybe we're proud of to get back to you at this point. But um, that way, if we do have, if we are do have an admissions officer that's traveling in your area, they might be able to stop by 